I just can't believe that we're here. I, it feels absolutely crazy. This is like 60,000 people, one of the biggest shows of its kind in the world, probably. Yo, who, is, who are you? That's us. Pumped is an understatement. Okay, so first up, Black Magic introduced their new cinema camera, four frame sensor, capable of filming up to 6K, it's got dual native ISO. Oh, it shoots internal RAW as well, and it's the L mount lens. So it's actually the very first time that I've been tempted by a Black Magic. Unfortunately, they haven't moved away from the very clunky toy-like body design, which feels very plasticky, and, but uh, spec-wise is very tempting. It, I reckon it's going to fly so seamlessly with DaVinci Resolve, and I think this is what they're going to go more towards to try and tie you into using their cameras as well. Yeah, big fan. Anyway, second thing from Blackmagic was their new phone camera app. Love the look of this. The UI is very, very nice. You've got your full manual controls. Very much reproduces actually their ecosystem. It works really well. So all of your monitoring things like full scholar, peaking, the anamorphic disk squeeze I think is included. Yeah. There's like safety margins. For mobile filmmaking, this is an incredible opportunity move. move. Mm. Mm. So next up, we've got some new lenses from Surui. Sure. Here they are with a sniper lens series. I mean, that sounds dangerous. F1.2, they're designed for APS-C, and most importantly, they have autofocus. 23mm, 33mm, and 56mm. Really lightweight as well, about 400 grams each. They're going to be perfect for gimbals. Certainly an exciting addition. They're also addition. super affordable. Yeah, they are. They're like very- $300? Another thing from Sure is the macro cinema lenses. We got to play with the 70mm 1x magnification and the 100mm 1.5x. To have a cinema lens capable of 1.5x magnification at an affordable price point is going to give you a whole new world of opportunities with regards to some absolutely crispy, tasty close ups. Wow. Atomos everywhere, all of the time, all of the things. First of all, Atomos had a really big and impressive stand at the IBC, so I think they are like really trying to push on. And they announced four new products, new products. The Ninja and the Ninja Ultra. They were already announced, be pre-IBC. Okay, pre-IBC, and then the Shogun and the Shogun Ultra. They're basically improvements on their existing products, but they are quite significant improvements. Globally, like the biggest one is the new OS system. Nicer UI, nicer user experience, and yeah, there's also a few like specs that are looking better in terms of like the Shogun being brighter, being capable of recording ProRes RAW up to 4K60 internally. All of these new products are also geared towards then the cloud solution, their own cloud solution for remote viewing, remote editing. Like I swear the whole point of a cloud is that it's omnipotent, omnipotent. Yeah, I guess you're And right now then. there's like an Atomos cloud, there's an Adobe cloud, there's a Blackmagic cloud. So Nanlite have introduced this new Pavo Slim panel light, which is a combination of a flexible light and a classic panel. Yeah, really nice light, and it's um, coming in like one by two and one by one sizes. And then you've got bicolor and also just RGB. And they're going to be very versatile because they're so kind of flat that you can really put them in a wide array of spaces. They have a separate power supply and feature V-mount and Sony NF. MPF batteries as well. We tried to go and get a coffee from the Fujifilm booth and we got 
swiftly rejected. They could smell that we were not Fuji people, I feel. But regardless of that, we'll mention it because it's a pretty big camera release. The GFX 100 Mark II. It's like a medium format beast. I think it was $3,000 cheaper than the predecessor. An insanely big sensor, 102 megapixels. You're getting really solid, low light performance. Full width 4K at 60p, so no cropping. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole aim is to try and bring medium format, digital medium format, more into the hands of like the prosumers and, and, and make it more accessible. It was also a very nice camera to handle. It's a good... Mm. Sony is where, sorry? Okay, how do we get there? Why does Sony have the most difficult location? We've made it to Sony. The search for the burrito commences. The Sony Burano, uh, cine to line. 8K shooting with IBIS and built-in NDs. It's like the perfect run and gun, perfect solo shooter for smaller crews. It handles really nicely, like it's not actually that big and, and bulky. No. And yeah, a cheeky price tag of 25,000 US. Bit of spare change there. Oh, also one of the things that I really liked about the Burano was that it's got that shooting capability where it does pre-roll and oh, post-roll. Yeah. So like Super documentaries, if you miss anything when you press record, it's, wow. you, you haven't missed it. Can we just, some things never change. <laughs> it's a pro cinema camera, not for us yet. Maybe I want it. Not for you either. I want it. I have a very interesting theory that so far I've failed to find anyone that agrees with me on. My take is you've got the FX3, which is a beast, and then in my opinion, the FX6 and the FX9 are becoming somewhat like obsolete as steps upwards towards Sony's high end cinema line. And like for me now, it's logical to have an FX3. And you should push with the FX3 until you've outgrown the FX3 and then the next upgrade. You need to upgrade when you feel like you need the Burano. My, my counter argument for that would be, I think the FX6 and the FX9 are just old. I can see myself going back on this when they announced an FX6 Mark II and being like, why would you get the Burano now that the FX6 Mark II is out? Because it'll probably be half the price or less than half the price and probably take some of the features of the Burano and then you're like, Burano is obsolete. Yeah, Sony do have a really interesting strategy when they bring out new cameras because they tend to give each new camera everything that the previous camera had that was amazing, so like... Yeah, to a certain extent they just like trickle down the features and then they just keep one thing from you or like, you know, a little feature that everyone's like, ah, oh, I just wish this was in. All of a sudden that G Master uh, 24mm f1.4 looks very silly on the Burano. Doesn't it? And also, the eye tracking looks very strange on a cinema camera this size as well. So this camera is going to be very popular with a very wide range of people. So, on even on a very high-end feature film, you might find that there are people that will want a second camera. They just don't have the budget for another Venice, so they'll use this because the picture quality will match. It might be that they want to use it on a gimbal or a crane, and while you do have the Rialto with the Venice, that's still quite expensive and heavy, and there's a cable. Whereas this is much lighter, there's no cable, so on a gimbal or steady cam, it might be that they might choose this instead. Then you've got the sort of lower budget, maybe like a TV drama, TV scripted, that would love to shoot on a Venice but can't afford it. Because with Venice, you've got to factor in things like the cost of the media as well. One card is 4,000 euros, whereas the cards for this are 400 euros. So there's a big, big difference in the whole total cost of ownership. And then you've got high-end documentary production where they want that cinema film quality. They want Venice quality, but again, smaller, more portable, lightweight, lower cost. Um, we're expecting it to be very popular with natural history productions because it has a up to 30 second pre-roll cache. It can do time lapse, um, can shoot up to 120 frames per second. So be really good for natural history. Um, and also just the, the solo filmmakers, the people that make their own productions and shorts that would love to have a Venice but can't afford it. So I think there's going to be a really broad appeal for it. And then there's one more release which we actually took part in creating a launch video for from our friends at Axoon um, with the Cineview Nano, which originally we were kind of like, what? I don't we're know. kind of skeptical. Yeah, we're kind of skeptical and then we used it and 
Boy, is it good. Because it's a, it's a low cost wireless transmitter that's kind of aimed towards content creators. Yes, it's capable of transmitting your footage live to your iPad or iPhone. Up to four devices. Up to four devices at the same time, yeah, which means you can be using an, iPad, uh, an iPhone on top of the camera for monitoring, and then your director can be watching on an iPad. Low latency, all the professional features you could ever dream of. Peaking, zebras, uh, grids, full color. Range. 500 feet range, the device is tiny, it's super, super light, so it doesn't add anything to the rig. Anything else on it? Just very cheap, $129. $129 for a wireless monitoring system. And we've used it a lot already. They told me I was going to make a career in filmmaking. 